Good morning, all. Uh, okay, as we said in the last class, uh, from this class onwards, uh, we are going to see helical antenna and uh, smart antennas. Okay, patch antenna and uh, antennas for uh, mobile and handset communications. All those things we are going to see. With that, uh, we will be winding up our fifth module. Okay. So today uh, we will start with helical antenna. Okay, uh, I think uh, <coughs> you might already um, have gone to uh, this helical antenna at least once or twice. We already had uh, exams based on this. So, it's just uh, we are refreshing the things. Okay, what is helical antenna and all? So, helical antenna is the simplest antenna to provide circularly polarized waves. Okay, uh, do you remember what is? Uh, a circular polarization and what is uh, elliptical polarization, linear polarization, all those things uh, we have discussed in I think in second second module or, or first module, uh, last portion of first module or second module uh, we have discussed okay, how this elliptical polarization is coming, how circular polarization is coming and all those things uh, in contact classes we have discussed. Okay, so uh, it's just you remember this much only, um, it is uh, this helical antenna is uh, producing circularly polarized waves. The polarization of waves will be circular polarization and it will be the simplest uh, form of antenna to provide this uh, circularly polarized waves. Okay. So uh, that is the basic thing you should understand about helical antenna. Okay, simplest antenna to provide circularly polarized waves. UHF and VHF antenna used in extraterrestrial communications. So, uh, by seeing the frequency itself, we can say whether it is being used in uh, extraterrestrial communications or not. It is used in ultra high frequency and very high frequency. Okay. These helical antennas can be used in ultra high frequency, that is UHF, and very high frequency, VHF. These frequencies normally we are using to do extraterrestrial communications. That means communication with uh, space or satellites or uh, beyond that. Okay. Satellites are located within the vicinity of Earth. Okay, so extraterrestrial means uh, we can say that uh, with another uh, like uh, we have seen uh, Mars mission and uh, Moon mission and all those things. In all those communications that are uh, purely extraterrestrial, that means uh, that are uh, not at all bounded by the gravitational force of Earth. The satellites and all they are bounded by the gravitational force of Earth and they are revolving around the Earth. Okay. Suppose if you are uh, going for a <coughs> Mars mission and all, Mars is not at all a satellite of Earth. Okay. So there uh, things are different. So in that much um, communications also we can use this. Okay. So that is the general gen general concepts. Okay. So uh, we are going to uh, the particular things that is uh, the construction and uh, design of helical antenna. So here uh, we will be just having an overview of uh, these things. So uh, after evaluating your answer sheets, uh, have a suggestion um, for your paper to follow uh, while you are writing the university examinations and all. In uh, notes and uh, <coughs> in notes and all, you will be given just points. Okay. So, uh, while writing the examination, it is not just uh, simply copying the points into your answer sheets. That is not the proper way. You have to understand, first you have to understand what the point is. Uh, there is no point in just mugging up the things at all. You have to understand what is the point. Then you have to elaborate based on the mark. Okay, suppose if it's a 10 mark question, you have to be a little bit elaborated. Suppose the same question is asking for 5 marks, points are enough. But uh, based on the marks, you have to uh, write the, uh, the answer. Okay. So if it is asking for a 10 mark question, means you have to elaborate that uh, concept. You have to understand first, then the concept you understood that you should write it in elaborate manner. And uh, diagrams are a must. Okay. Diagrams are must. 50 percentage of marks uh, will be given to uh, diagrams and the figures at all. Okay. So that you should 
take care of. So, uh, in that way only you should approach a, a university examination. It's not like they're just writing the point, point by point, then uh, just uh, writing or like just drawing one or two figures. That won't help. Okay. So, uh, please keep that in mind while you are studying. Okay. While you are studying itself, you should study in such a way that you can, you should be able to write the university examination. Okay. So, <coughs> we'll move on to the construction. Uh, it consists of a, a thick copper wire wound in the shape of a screw thread and used as an antenna in conjunction with a flat metal plate called a ground plate. It's nothing but a ground plate will be there, a flat metal plate. From that, like a screw, like a screw, okay, like a screw, uh, the helix, the copper wire will be twisted in form of helix. That means like a screw, okay. One end of the helix is connected to the center conductor. And in the center, uh, one conductor will be there in the center of the helix. And one end of the helix is connected to the center conductor. One end of that helix will be connected to the center conductor of the cable. And the outer conductor is connected to the ground plate. Okay. That is the basic construction is that much only. There is uh, nothing but uh, nothing more to add uh, to that construction. Uh, this is, these are the points in construction. Simply we can say in two circles, that is construction. Okay. So uh, this uh, almost it will look like this. Mm, you can see a uh, ground plate and a coaxial feed to that. This coaxial feed will be connected to the other end. Okay. And H is the total height. H, L, uh, different uh, terminologies uh, are used. So here it is H. And uh, D is the helical diameter, diameter of the helix. And S is the separation between two helix. Okay. So alpha and all, uh, we will, uh, you can see one alpha, one angle included angle alpha there. That uh, we will see later. Okay. That we are uh, going to see in the next slides. At that time, we will come back. So for the time being, D is the diameter, H or L. L, L is also represented for the, uh, L is also represented as length here. And it is shown as height, so H is used. Both are same one. And S is the separation between two individual helixes. Okay. D is the helical diameter. So this is the uh, basic structure of a helical antenna. So the basic things you have to remember is the ground plane and the helical structure. Okay. Now uh, we will move on to the parameters. With the parameters uh, on which its radiation depends. Of course, the diameter of the helix. Okay. Then Yes, S is the turn spacing from center to center. You can see here. Yes, that is the spacing between individual helixes or individual turns. Turns is the correct word. Okay, S is the spacing between individual turns. D is the helical diameter. So, based on the helical diameter and based on the uh, spacing between the helixes, the radiation characteristics are going to change. Okay, then alpha, that is the pitch up. Okay. So pitch angle you see at bottom it is defined. Pitch angle is the angle between a line tangent to helix and plane normal to helix axis. So what will be that angle you see? It is the angle between a line tangent to helix. Okay, there should be a line which is tangent to helix. And there is a plane which is normal to helix axis. Okay, we will see. see? Uh, this is the helix helix or helical antenna okay so first we have to see helical axis or helix axis then we have to find a plane normal to the helix axis what will be the helix axis here the helix axis will, will be going through the centers of the helix so it will be a straight line like this okay then a plane normal to that a plane normal to that means a vertical plane which will be projecting outside the monitor okay. in that way also or uh, from another side one plane uh, can also come okay let it be there one plane uh, any plane perpendicular to this axis uh, perpendicular to this straight line any plane you can consider okay so if you are considering it as uh, z axis 
then you can consider x y plane is perpendicular to that then a line tangent to helix that is the next point so a line tangent to helix means this can be the line tangent to helix or this can be also the line tangent to helix so here you see that is shown alpha is shown here alpha is this angle okay so the plane has been taken as the plane the plane perpendicular to helical axis has been taken as the one which is projecting outside the monitor okay which is projecting outside of the screen that is the uh, plane uh, chosen which is perpendicular to the uh, axis okay then one line we should uh, get which is tangential to the helix see this is that line which is tangential to helix that means it, that line will go like this okay it will go like this it will just touch the helix at one point and it will go that's the tangent okay this line and a plane which is projecting outwards that in angle the incoming angle between those two is referred as alpha or pitch angle okay so in one like this if we are uh, plotting one side will be pi d pi d means what diameter of the diameter of the turn or diameter of the helix okay so uh, if you are taking alpha if you are taking tan tan will be opposite side by adjacent side so tan alpha will be s by pi d so alpha will be equal to tan inverse s by pi d okay so if pi d can also be represented as c or circumference okay it is just uh, d is the diameter and pi into d will give the circumference that's it okay so alpha pitch angle is defined as tan inverse s by pi d or tan inverse s by c where c is the circumference of the helix so l is the axial length okay that is n into s you see what is s here s is the separation between turns okay suppose if there are n turns what will be the total length of the helix n into what is the separation between each helix number of helix is uh, number of turns are n okay then number uh, separation between uh, each turn is s so just multiply n into s we will be getting the total length that is shown here or uh, total length or axial length so that is l l is the axial length n is the number of turns and l naught is the length of one turn okay so if there are n number of turns and s is the uh, separation between the turns total length will be or axial length will be n into s that is simple logic so now we will move on to the radiation characteristics okay the helix can be considered to have number of small loops and short dipoles connected in series in which loop diameter is helix diameter and helix spacing is dipole length that is uh, another insight to this uh, particular arrangement helical angle here uh, we can consider a helix as a number of small loops and short dipoles small loops okay of course you can understand from the figure here uh, so many small it can be considered as so many small small loops okay each turn can be considered as a loop and what is this which is connected in between this structure can you like relate with any other antenna we have studied you see a dipole antenna will look like this one end towards top and one end towards bottom okay so uh, this can like this, this can be uh, like considered as a similar look with a dipole antenna okay just this portion okay from here to here and here to here it can be considered as uh, equivalent to a dipole antenna and uh, these are individual loops so the total thing can be considered as an arrangement of small small loops and dipoles okay that is the idea 
have a number of small loops and short dipoles connected in series okay in which loop diameter is helix diameter and helix spacing is dipole length that only i have told just uh, just i have told okay so <clears throat> the dipole if we are considering it has a series connection of dipoles and loops this is the dipole part okay this leg and this leg up to here and these are the loops okay so dipole length will be this one s yes. spacing will be dipole length okay this towards top and this towards bottom and uh, loop diameter what will be loop diameter that is d itself okay loop diameter is the helix diameter so uh, which in which loop diameter is helix diameter and helix spacing is dipole length so uh, we can consider it in uh, that manner and now we are based on that we are going to analyze the two principal modes of operation of a helical angle okay basically there are two principal modes of operation okay for a helical angle or just for a helix there are two principal modes of operation first one is normal or broadside and second one is axial or in fire modes okay we will see uh, one by one normal mode of operation okay so this is broadside and uh, axial mode is n fire case you already know what is broadside and what is n fire okay so here it is the uh, normal mode of operation <coughs> so here field is maximum in the broadside direction what is the broadside direction it will be towards the sides okay broad side end fire means it will be towards the end of the axis and uh, broad side means it will be towards the side of the axis that is the basic difference so okay let me just uh, take your attendance we see whether uh, online attendance is working or not Yes, it's working. I think. Okay, I've taken your attendance. Yeah, we will move on to our presentation. Here, in the normal mode of operation, field is maximum in the broadside direction. What's the direction is the direction normal to helix okay so one more thing you have to notice that is the major difference here here l l what is l l is n into s okay you have seen here l is axial length that is length of the axis which is nothing but n into s where n is the number of times and this is the separation between each times so l should be much much less than lambda what is lambda here for lambda not that is the operating frequency so the operating wavelengths okay so if the antenna is designed to operate at a particular wavelength that l should be or the total length axial length should be much much lower when compared to lambda here the bandwidth and radiation efficiency is low Okay, bandwidth is low. That is uh, quite understandable since L is much much less than lambda. We cannot uh, operate it for a large range of frequencies, so bandwidth will be less. So how it can be increased? Just increase the helix size. Okay, both can be increased by increasing the helical size. Now we are coming to pitch angle. When alpha equal to zero, the helix reduces to a small loop when alpha equal to 90 degree helix reduces to a short dipole we will see uh, how first we will case uh, we will see the case uh, alpha equal to 90 degree here <coughs> we are taking alpha equal to 90 degree so what will happen alpha equal to 90 degree means this should come here a parallel line okay so this should be this two should make a 90 degree that means what only this thing won't be there 
okay only these two will be there this cannot be connected to together okay that means there will not be this loop it will reduce to a short dipole okay so uh, when alpha equal to zero we will see what will happen when alpha equal to zero alpha equal to zero means this will come and coincide with this what does that mean this won't be there okay only the loops will be there okay so alpha equal to zero means this s will be vanishing okay this will come and this will join with this so in effect yes won't be there okay yes won't be there means what this spacing won't be there okay this spacing won't be there so what will happen only the loops will be there so that's the uh, basic idea behind this when alpha equal to 90 degree the helix reduces to a small loop when alpha sorry when alpha equal to 0 degree the helix reduces to a small loop when alpha equal to 90 degree the helix reduces to short time yeah. so uh, this is the uh, basic uh, representation of uh, this uh, normal mode of operation uh, and uh, one one more thing we, we can see here see from here that axis helical axis is going and it is connected to one end one end of the helix is connected to that axis okay and the another end is connected to the plate here that that is visible here this is just a uh, more uh, clearer version of the old figure okay more detailed version of the old figure <coughs> now we are moving on to the equations here uh, you are not at all having to uh, derive anything okay since the derivations are more complex and all there is no need to derive anything but uh, as far as exams are concerned they have to somewhat remember these equations that will be better for uh, obtaining good marks okay so that is the thing here you have to somewhat remember these things the power field of small loop is given by e phi is equal to 100 pi square i sin theta divided by r delta square into a where a is the area of the loop okay then uh, far field of short dipole is given by uh, 60 pi i sin theta divided by r, r lambda into s there is a phase difference of 90 degree between the fields ratio of magnitude of these fields provides axial ratio this axial ratio and all you have to remember okay s lambda divided by 2 pi a where a is the area s you know is the separation between the turns and lambda is the wavelength okay so this uh, at least this axial ratio you have to remember it's better to remember both e theta and e phi uh, in far field and uh, far field of small loop and far field of uh, short dipole it is better to remember both and if you are just taking the ratio of the, that, that two you'll be getting axial ratio then there is no need to uh, remember axial ratio separately okay uh, because it's, it can uh, sometimes uh, they may ask any problems uh, based on this they may they will not they will never ask for the derivations of these equations but uh, this this problems they can ask and uh, while uh, writing this explanation that like, like writing the theory construction working and everything uh, these equations you can include you should include then only you will, you will get good marks okay so if axial ratio is equal to one polarization of the antenna becomes circular so as axial ratio uh, can uh, the equation is we already seen s lambda divided by 2 pi a this should be equal to one that means s lambda should equal to 2 pi a that is only shown here s lambda equal to 2 pi a okay so s lambda equal to a just uh, it is the area by d square by 4 so that is the calculation only is shown here so in such uh, in order to get the circular polarized uh, after deriving it should be s is equal to c square by 2 lambda okay and you know what is s okay and c is pi dc is the circumference okay in such that's such case uh, what will happen to the pitch angle just substitute 
uh, alpha equal to tan by s by c. That is the general equation. In that s, you can substitute c square by 2 lambda. So alpha should be tan inverse c by 2 lambda. This is the condition for pitch angle to get circular polarization. Okay. The basic requirement to get circular polarization is axial ratio should be 1. Okay. That is AR. Axial ratio is not actual ratio. I saw in some answer sheets uh, they are written like actual ratio. Okay, it is not actual ratio, it is axial ratio. Axis, axial ratio. Okay. If axial ratio is equal to 1, we will get circularly polarized wave. For that, uh, in order to become axial ratio is equal to 1, as lambda is equal to 2 pi a. That is the condition. Just uh, substitute the condition and uh, derive the condition for S. Okay. Then um, substitute pi d in that equation. You will be getting S is equal to c square by 2 lambda. C is equal to since C is equal to pi d. Okay. Then from that, uh, substitute that condition into the general equation of pitch angle. You will get the condition for circular polarization. Okay. The condition for pitch angle in order to get circular polarization. That's all. That's all about the normal mode. Then we will move on to axial mode of operation. The axial mode operation was discovered by physicist John Lickross. Okay. Has anybody uh, like seen his name anywhere? Are you familiar with his name? John Lickross. He is only discovered uh, this uh, mode of operation, axial mode of operation of uh, this antenna. Has anybody heard? No one heard about him. I don't get it from the very very John D. Cross. Yeah, at least one should reply. John D. Cross is not a very good color. I will be able to get it. But the idea is that the number of papers 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 is that I have to do a textbook with John D. Cross. I have to do a circular polarization. I have to do a axial mode of operation. I have to do a textbook with John D. Cross. I have to do a textbook with John D. Cross. I have to do a textbook with John D. Cross. I have to so, I have a last class. I have a 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 class. I Okay, anyway, uh, I think you have a in this mode, uh, the maximum radiation is in the end fair direction that we know already. This axial mode is also called end fair mode. Polarization is circular since all uh, this uh, mechanical antennas are for circular polarization. This mode occurs when S and D of the order of one wavelength. Okay, that is the difference here. In the previous case, uh, that L should be much much less than lambda, but here. Yes, the separation between the individual terms and D, the diameter of the helix. Both should be of the order of one wavelength. Then this axial mode happens. This mode produces broad and directional beam in the axial direction and minor lobes at oblique angles. Here, the broad and directional beam it will produce in the axial direction. Okay. That means parallel to the axis. Okay, parallel to the axis. In the first case, it was 
perpendicular to the axis, but here it is parallel to the axis and it will be a directional beam. Okay, so it will be highly directional beam. This mode gives broad bandwidth and good directional beam in the axial direction. Okay. So, uh, uh, since it is axial mode of operation, it will give good direction in the axial direction and uh, broad bandwidth because uh, this uh, just in the order of one wavelength that is only the condition. So, we can uh, use it for different uh, types of wavelengths. In axial mode, terminal impedance of helical antenna lies between 100 ohm to 200 ohm. These are just points you have to remember. So, terminal impedance is given by R is equal to. 140 lambda by c uh, c is equal to 5 d so uh, here you can see the difference between normal mode and axial mode see the normal mode here the helix is shown here so normal mode is also a broadside mode so the radiation pattern will be perpendicular okay the radiation pattern will be perpendicular to the axis so this is the axis and the radiation pattern that is perpendicular to the axis that we have seen for the normal broadside case that is only here so next is the axial mode it is n fair case so radiation pattern will be parallel to the axis so this is the axis and radiation pattern is parallel but why this slope is missing here why this slope is missing here it is uh, just a normal broadside case only that we have derived in uh, contact classes also here uh, this both uh, towards both sides these patterns are visible radiation patterns are visible but here one major lobe is there in the axial direction and two minor lobes are there of course they can be then what happened to this back lobe or uh, towards this side one more major lobe has to be there what happened to that any idea any suggestion Okay, if you are interested in this topic, just think about that. And if you have any doubt, you can ask me. Okay. I think it is not required to explain each and everything like this. So something has to be left for you. So this is, if anybody is interested, they can just think about that. It's a just very simple concept. Okay. So uh, we will move on. So that's all with that. Axial mode and the parameters. Just uh, go through that. You have to. It's not necessary to remember, but still you can just go through. Okay. These are the parameters: bandwidth, bandwidth between first and half power, bandwidth gain, directive, etc. So, now you move on to the advantages: circular polarization or wide bandwidth. That is a uh, major advantage of this. Okay. And uh, circular polarization, we can have, have over a wide bandwidth that we just uh, told how the bandwidth we can use it for a large bandwidth. Since the, it is just saying that the ratio or uh, the S and D should be in the order of one wavelength, that is only the condition. So it is possible to use it for a wide range of frequencies, hence, bandwidth will be more. So, circular polarization, uh, we can achieve circular polarization over wide bandwidth, simplicity, more efficient. These are the general advantages okay and capability of receiving signals of arbitrary polarization that is one uh, thing is uh, specific here by the receiving mode it can receive and any arbitrary polarized wave okay so that is the advantage then uses you already saw the uses satellite and space communications transmitting or receiving signals in the high frequency and the vhf and the uhf also okay these are the uses general things so this is a uh, practical helical antenna. Okay, this is a practical helical antenna. You can uh, see uh, the arrangement, the axis. You can see uh, it is uh, used in uh, Space Labs US. So here you can see the axis here, and the helix is there, and one end is connected with the axis. Here, see, helical antenna is continuously connected with the axis, and this is the plate. And one end of the helical antenna is connected with the plate. Okay. So this is a uh, structure with four antennas. Okay. One, two, three, four antennas. And it is uh, currently it is used for extraterrestrial communication. So this is another one, a uh, much closer look you can have. This is a plate, this is the axis, and the helix also you can see. Okay. And here uh, two helixes are there. 
it is uh, much more advanced version okay one helix gloss will go like this and one helix will go like this one helix is shown in white color and one helix is shown in black color okay these are the current more advanced advanced antennas of helical type okay so that's all about the helical antenna and we will move on to micro strip or patch antenna i must say micro strip antenna that is only this micro strip antenna or patch antenna so this uh, micro strip or patch antenna is a uh, very uh, common type of antenna okay so <coughs> We are using it uh, like uh, this is uh, the thing about this is uh, you may not have you might not have noticed like where we are using this uh, patch and our microscope patch. but it is everywhere wherever you cannot see physically the antenna there uh, 90 percentage uh, it can be a microscope or patch antenna. okay that is the thing because these are as the name suggests it is micro it is very small antenna Okay, so uh, if the antenna is uh, not visible clearly, then like, mostly it can be a microscope antenna. Otherwise, this Yagiuda antenna and uh, this dish parabolic antenna and even uh, helical antenna, all these antennas are clearly visible. Okay, like uh, we have to install it on a, on a particular apparatus and all. But here uh, we can just uh, incorporate it in a microscope or we can just use a patch as an antenna that's the difference so uh, how it evolved that's the first thing that says in uh, spacecraft or aircraft where size cost performance ease of installation and aerodynamic profile are constraints low profile antennas like microscope antennas used okay spacecraft aircraft Okay, what's the problem with spacecraft and aircraft it is highly dependent on the size okay in spacecraft and aircraft or all in spacecraft especially like uh, the load payload is very much important the payload should be as minimum as possible so uh, in once uh, while launching this uh, one uh, space shuttle i don't uh, exactly remember uh, the name of that space shuttle uh, NASA uh, did painting on the space shuttle. Okay, just they painted the space shuttle. So uh, the next time, what they did, they just uh, removed the. They, they didn't go for the painting and all. So they just uh, saved the paint. But that was not the actual savings. Just by avoiding the painting, they were able to save around. Uh, 200 liters of uh, fuel that fuel savings was very very high because just to uh, reach a particular payload to outer space it is uh, going to consume a large amount of a large amount of fuel okay so in order to save that uh, while designing space shuttle and all we have to make the payload as minimum as possible in order to save fuel Okay, the saving fuel is not the not at all the main cons uh, constraint. If we have to use that much fuel, means that much fuel should be preserved up to outer space. Okay, so that is a main problem here. So there, the designs are in such a way that it has to be as small as possible and as light as possible. It should be lighter weight small in size etc etc so there these antennas can be used okay microstrip antennas and uh, there is a one more very common area where these microstrip antennas are used that is also left to you you can think and you can come to a conclusion one more area is there where size matters okay there there also this microstrip or patch antennas are used very widely that also you can think and you can research and you can find out okay then these antennas can be flush mounted to metal or other existing surfaces and they only require space for the feed line which is normally placed behind the ground plane they can be flush mounted means they can be inserted to a metal or other existing surfaces okay 
and the thing is they only require space for the feed line any antenna requires feed line space for feed line so here uh, the only space requirement is that only and that too normally placed behind the ground plane or to the plane where it is being inserted okay so that is also not at all uh, consuming any space <coughs> It is popular at frequencies above 100 megahertz. That is high frequencies. Okay. So uh, in low frequencies, it is not that much popular. In high frequencies above 100 megahertz, it is very popular. And uh, how uh, it's, it looks like or how the uh, work design. It consists of a rectangular patch on a dielectric coated ground plane. Okay. A rectangular patch will be inserted on a dielectric coated ground plane. The radiating element and feed lines are normally photo etched on the dielectric substrate. What is etching? Etching. Or what is photo etching? Etching. Okay, yeah, okay, you are a sixth semester. Uh, you, are, you are not studying VLSI. Yes, VLSI is you are studying VLSI now. Then uh, you will be knowing what is etching. Photo etching. Are you studying this uh, VLSA or not? I think Hakim sir is only taking you uh, this VLSA. Are you studying in this semester VLSA? Just reply yes or no at least. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, then uh, you'll be uh, knowing what is etching and what is photo etching. There is, uh, I, I don't think there is uh, any necessary to any necessity to explain about that. So uh, the thing is, it is uh, very clear. <coughs> the radiating elements and feed lines. Okay, both the radiating element and feed lines are photo etched on the director substrate. One director substrate will be there. To the dielectric substrate, the radiating elements and feed lines are etched, photo etched. That means we are using light. Okay, photo etched on the dielectric substrate. Coaxial feed lines, where the inner conductor of the coaxial line is attached to the radiating patch, are widely used. Okay. Feed lines means that will be coaxial feed lines. Okay, coaxial feed lines. Have you ever seen any coaxial feed uh, feed lines? Okay. Any coaxial cable? Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen any coaxial cable? No, I think coaxial cable can be turned off. Yes or no, at least. Have you ever seen any coaxial cable? Link it you. Yes. Where? Yes. We got to replace. Yes. Okay. Where? Cable. Which cable? Cable. Cable means which cable? Cable TV. TV cable. After that, we are Okay. That is okay. Correct answer. But after a simple item, we are going your CRO probe. So, Coaxial feed lines where the inner conductor of the coaxial line is attached to the radiating patch are widely used. Now you will be uh, getting an idea. Coaxial feed lines are used in that inner conductor of the coaxial line. Then we have a problem that the inner conductor is not the outer conductor. Inner conductor is not the outer conductor. The inner conductor of the coaxial line is attached to the radiating patch. The inner core will be attached to the radiating patch that are widely used. The strip is designed so that the pattern maximum is normal to the patch. The radiation pattern will be uh, 
the maximum radiation pattern will be perpendicular to the patch. <coughs> that is the design of the strip. So we will see um, the design. Okay. So this is the patch. One substrate will be there. These things they will be familiar in VLSA. Okay. We already have studied big, big stuff substrates and all. So this is a substrate. So that is a dielectric thing that is here. Epsilon R is shown here. So this will be having a little height H. And here we are etching our patch. Okay, our patch we are photo etched. Okay, photo etching our patch here and will be feed line will be here. Okay. So radiating slots will be there. Okay, normal to it will be normal to the axis or normal to the patch. So, so patch length is L and uh, radiating slot one here it will be there and one here also it will be there. So two radiating slots will be there. This is a microscope pattern. We will be having a side view of that. Okay, this is the uh, top view, and we will be having a side view. This is the substrate epsilon r, and uh, see this up to this depth it is etched, and uh, it is projected to this small l. Some projection will be there outside. That is only shown here. See this portion. Okay, and that length is l. So <coughs> this is how. Uh, the microstrip antenna is etched into the substrate. Okay, in that uh, we can see that the radiating element and feed lines are photo etched. Okay, in that uh, coaxial feed lines, where inner conductor of the coaxial line is attached to the radiating patch that are widely used. Okay, so here this is the radiating patch. The inner core of the conductor will be attached to this patch. While etching itself, they will photo etch that. Okay. That is the thing, microstrip antenna. So uh, these are the patch parameters. Okay, based on these parameters only, we are going to design patch. Okay, operating frequency that is uh, 100 megahertz. Wavelength will be around three meters. Thickness of the patch T should be less than lambda by 100. Thickness of substrate that should be much much less than lambda. Okay, length of the patch that is L should be less than lambda by 2, width of the patch less than lambda, dielectric constant should be almost equal to 2. Okay. These are the uh, general patch parameters which uh, based on which we are going to uh, design the patch antenna or uh, microstrip antenna. Okay, so <coughs> I think uh, we can stop here because uh, one more class we are having uh, tomorrow. So uh, by tomorrow, uh, the session will be completed. The review of module 5 will be completed and uh, our semester uh, 6 will be completed, I think. Okay, so it is subject to any further decision from the uh, department. Okay, as of now, that is the condition. So I think uh, we can uh, stop here today.